grateful to live. We're grateful to live on land that is the territory of the Seelf First Nations who have called Okanagan home for thousands of years. Many First Nations communities here in BC are in fairly remote locations, not connected to power grids. So diesel generators is, is often um, the norm. So, and I don't know if you know that the province is working with a number of indigenous communities to get these alternate energy projects up and running. So the goal is to reduce by 80% the use of these polluting and high emission diesel generators, but also to provide uh, economic benefits to the communities involved. Here in our own region, the, the Lower Nicola Indian Band near Merritt, they, about a few years ago, they installed over 300 panels of photovoltaic solar, uh, generates up to 85 kilowatts of electricity. This is now the largest community owned system in BC helping to power not only their school, but it feeds electricity back into the local grid. Former Chief Aaron Sumahelza has said, this system generates many returns for the Lower Nicola community. They're saving energy, they're educating their youth, uh, there's community pride for years to come. He said, it's not just investing in renewable energy, it's about investing in our children and in our grandchildren and future generations. It's about investing in the environment, taking care of the water, the land, and the animals. Aaron says, we think it's a deeper investment than just a financial one. So turning to this evening, First Things First has been hosting these monthly deep dives since uh, 2022, sorry, since 2020, since COVID, uh, presenting speakers who bring different perspectives on climate solutions, what we hope is that by learning together, we are gaining insight into what we can accomplish here in the Okanagan. So it's Lori Goldman is tonight's Zoom technician. If you have any um, uh, questions for her, put it in chat. If you have any technical issues, and as you, as you hear, the session is being recorded. Uh, and she'll send the link to you so you can see it again or pass it on to friends that might have missed tonight along with any interesting links that, uh, or, uh, that come up that people mention, or we'll, we'll include those in the email that you'll get to find. So I'm gonna turn things over now to Sue Kirschman. She's gonna to introduce tonight's topic and the guest speaker. Thanks. Great, thanks, Margaret. Um, as more and more people buy electric cars and switch to electric heat pumps for home heating and cooling, we need to consider our electricity infrastructure and supply. Will it be able to meet the growing demand? Some groups say we will need three site C's in order to meet this future demand, and other groups say we can have clean, reliable, affordable electricity without new mega dams or nuclear projects, instead using lots of renewable energy like wind and solar, combined with energy storage, energy efficiency, and better transmission connections. The Canadian Renewable Energy Association has a vision to reach net zero by 2050 that is based on wind, solar, and, and storage industries that already exist, and which they say can deliver the electricity that will be needed, providing the right legislation and regulation is put in place. The University of Victoria has done four years of modeling research, which has been compiled into a report called Shifting Power, um, that the David Suzuki Foundation has published. And this report shows that Canada can have 100% clean energy even earlier by 2035, and also how we can do it. And Laurie will put links to these two reports in the chat, as well as a link to a report by the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, which examines what it will mean in practical terms to achieve a net zero future. So I encourage you to take a look at these reports when you have time. Tonight, sorry, one second. Tonight, Trade and Power will talk about our provincial and municipal electric systems with respect to future demand for EV charging. Drayden is the new electric utility manager for the city of Penticton. He is an engineer and a former manager of EV infrastructure and investment with Fortis BC. Drayden is passionate about this fast moving industry and the challenges ahead to meet the needs of electric vehicles. So 
So thank you for being here tonight, Drayden. We appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. And just one more thing before I turn it over to you. If anyone thinks of questions during Drayden's presentation, just please type them into the chat and Margaret will compile them and ask Drayden after he's finished speaking. So with that, um, Drayden, I'll turn it over to you. Please go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sue. And thank you, Margaret, as well. Is everyone, are you able to see my screen? Yes, great. Perfect, fantastic. Okay, well, thank you everyone. As I was introduced, my name is Drayden Power. I am the, recently, I just got a position as the electric utility manager for the city of Penticton. Tonight, I'm gonna to be talking to you about one of my favorite topics in the industry today, and that's electric vehicle charging, as well as some other aspects of it, and our electric grid. First, I will announce that I'm also presenting tonight from the traditional lands of the CX people in the Okanagan. I'm up here in West Kelowna. Okay, so a presentation overview here. We're gonna start by telling you who I am and why I think I'm qualified to be giving this talk. Then we're gonna go into the climate conversation that surrounds EVs and the energy future of our province. We'll go into some details about EV charging. We'll, go, we'll talk about service upgrades for if you do buy an electric vehicle or get a heat pump and wanna up, upsize your electrical panel or your electrical service. We'll talk about what happens when everyone does that and the impact to the overall system. And then we'll go through some opportunities to save money on making these conversions with rebates. And lastly, we'll go over some carbon credits, which is an awesome, awesome part of living in BC and Canada that there are these programs out there. So first, a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Summerland, BC. After high school, I attended the University of Victoria to get my engineering degree. After I completed university and even a little bit before, I started working for Fortis BC. Fortis BC is a vertically integrated electric utility. And by that, I mean, they do generation, transmission and distribution. So I like to say a picture of this beautiful dam is a good example, but from the water flowing down a pen stock and turning those generators to you turning on your lights at home, I've touched it, I've designed it, I've broken it and I've fixed some of it. Well, most of it actually, hopefully, uh, but I've taken some good pictures along the way too. So as you can see here, this is our Juanita plant uh, in the Kootenays that's just out, outside of Trail BC. And then this other picture that I just brought up is Brilliant Dam just outside of Castlegar. Now in 2019, I moved back into West Kelowna and I began working for Fortis as the distribution standards engineer. So I'd switched positions. Uh, my time in this position was great because it, it gave me an opportunity to get really familiar with distribution assets, which is beneficial for the position I'm in now because the city of Penticton operates their own distribution system. During my time there, I, I was lucky enough to do a lot of different things. And this is a great photo of me in Princeton, actually. And I swear there is a power line behind there. Uh, you just can't see it from the photo, but that is what I was doing out there, not just going for a hike with some PPE on. Um, and for the last 12 months, so in 2022, I was the manager of EV infrastructure and investment with Fortis BC. Uh, my role there was Primarily, there was kind of three aspects to it. There was managing the public charging infrastructure. So these fast chargers that you see here in this photo are in Naramata, fully accessible site. It was one of our favorite ones. Um, I was responsible for policy and legislation and incentives. So trying to attract people to buy and charge an electric vehicle as well as other electric load, while also trying to mitigate that demand, which is what tonight's talk will be about. And then also looking at the overall system impact and how, how we can support the grid long term and support the other departments that are working on this. So before we go into the details of EV charging, I just want to go through a little bit about the climate conversation. So this is always fun to bring up at first because whenever you start this discussion, everyone has a good idea of this, right? You say, what transportation fuel has the lowest carbon footprint or the least impact for the climate? Some people are bringing up hydrogen, some people are bringing up electricity, some people say, hey, what about renewable natural gas? Hydrogen is an interesting conversation too, because there's colors, there's blue, there's green, there's gray. Electricity, it matters, well, where was it generated? How was it generated? Is it coal burning? Are you importing it into the province? All of it kind of comes up. But what people often neglect to realize is that the best way is not to just transition our fuel consumption, but to actually reduce it right? The reduction of energy that we spend on transportation is important too. And that's why active transportation in your local municipalities is so important. So as I said, I'm lucky enough to be working for the city of Penticton now. 
And one of the efforts that the city has put forward towards this is the Community Climate Action Plan. Okay, so there's many things going on with this. There's kind of six big moves that have to happen. Three of those big moves involve transportation. Okay, so when you think about your daily commute of getting to work, and you might be taking a passenger vehicle by yourself, right? Is it possible to be transitioning that instead of just to an electric vehicle to a bike commute? Is it an electric bike or even walking, right? So that's why the city is putting forward things like on-street painted bike lanes, all ages and abilities bike lanes, multi-use paths and trails. So you're able to walk or jog or hike or whatever you wanna do. They're creating the lake to lake bike route. They're supporting zero emissions public transit, which is an awesome initiative I like to be working with BC Transit on. We're obviously supporting the adoption of passenger EVs with things like charging stations, rebates for uh, multi-unit residential buildings to do their EV ready plans to see what it's actually gonna take to, to put EV chargers in an apartment building. And of course, trying to decarbonize commercial transportation, which uh, requires quite a bit of work, but the city's working on many programs to do that, including putting fast chargers around the city to give commercial, commercial trucks and, uh, and SUVs an opportunity to charge. You can see down here, I've put a little uh, snippet from the, from the uh, official city plan that shows just the priority that the city has for different transportation. So as you can see the top of the pyramid, the first thing the city is going to be trying to prioritize for transportation is walking, right? And that's to allow for not, as, not only the transition to electric vehicles, but actually the reduction of the energy consumed. And this is one of those methods that's gonna help us sustain our electric grid long-term. So instead of just thinking of the transition, think of the reduction as well. And it's not just for the benefits that we, that we commonly think of, but there's actually monetary value to this, right? The fuel switching is actually cheaper. Using electricity is cheaper than using traditional gas. But beyond that, you look at the climate impact that it has, right? Penticton has done this study to prove that about 55% of Penticton's emissions are due to transportation. As you can see, the lion's share of is coming from the passenger vehicle section and also the dollars spent on it are right behind. And what's fun about this is that when you think about all the money that you're spending on gas, that money is leaving the province, leaving your community and is probably leaving the province too. But when you're charging with electricity that's provided to you by your local municipality or by a, a local utility that's operating and living within our province, that money is staying in-house. It's staying within your communities it's staying within your province. It's getting reinvested back into either innovative initiatives or into your own municipality functions and your own municipality infrastructure. And that's pretty exciting stuff. So that's what I was gonna bring up in terms of the community aspect of it. And now I'm ready to get into the gory details of electric vehicle charging terms. So our friend here has just purchased his electric vehicle and he has a ton of questions, okay? He's looking at all these terms, he's saying amps, Volts, kilovolt amps, kilowatt hours, kilowatts, level one, two, and three charging. What is going on? What is going on? So we're here to kind of debrief, demystify all of this. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about is batteries. I'm going to use the traditional gas pump as an analogy to kind of explain it. So you've probably seen these two values that come up more often than not, and that's the kilowatt and the kilowatt hour. They're very similar, obviously. One just has an hour attached to it, but they mean very different things. So first we're gonna do the kilowatt, okay? The kilowatt is how fast something can charge or how much energy it can output instantaneously like a motor, right? The comparison here to gas is how many liters per minute can that pump provide your tank, okay? And this is what you're commonly seeing when you're measuring how fast a fast charger is or a level one, two or three charger. What's its kilowatt output? How fast can it charge my battery? Okay, the kilowatt hour is the capacity. So comparison to gas, how big is your tank? How much battery can you store on board before you have to charge again? Okay, so the kilowatt, how fast you can charge. The kilowatt hour, how big is that battery? How much capacity does it have? Next, we're gonna talk about charging. Okay, so there's level one, there's level two, and there's level three. And level three is also known as DC fast charging. We'll do that one last. Okay, so your level one charger is going to plug into a standard 15 amp outlet that you have in your house, just like any other appliance or any other thing you have. Now, 
When you're plugged in there, you plug the other end into your vehicle, which looks a little bit like this. And this is broken down, obviously, with a nice graphic color layout, but it's called the J1772 plug. And it's the standard plug. If you own a Tesla, it'll look different, obviously, but most vehicles today look like this for level one and level two charging. Now, when you're plugged into a normal outlet, what you're going to get is about 1.8 kilowatts max. Okay. Now, most people will say level one, that won't work. It's not fast enough. And that's true for, for most or for some driving. But realistically, for just going to the office and back or going for a grocery run and back, a level one will be able to recharge your battery fully within five to eight hours. So if you're not doing large long distance commutes or often leaving the house for multiple trips, a level one may actually be sufficient for you. Now, you do lose some of the other benefits that I'll talk about later, uh, later this evening, but it's important to understand that level one charging does have a place and most vehicles will come with a level one charger that'll plug right into your wall. So it's something you should, you should be aware that is feasible depending on your driving characteristics. Now, keep in mind that if you're completely drained, that battery is gonna take over 24 hours to recharge, right? So this is mainly used as a feasible solution for short commutes. But if you only had level one charging and the off chance that you did need a big charge, you could always go and use one of the public fast chargers. Level two. So now in a level two plug, you're still plugging into the same way in your vehicle, but the other side is now plugging into what you see here. And that's a NEMA 1450R receptacle. So this is a 240 volt receptacle that you would typically see for an oven range or maybe a laundry machine, maybe a fridge or a dishwasher if it's a high energy one. Uh, now this is gonna be able to get you a lot faster. So this can get up to 19.2 kilowatts technically is the maximum that you can actually provide from level two, but that's not realistic. Most people are charging around 7.7 .7 kilowatts for a, a level two charger that you would put in your home and plug in or even directly wire. And that's going to be a 40 amp breaker on a 32 amp circuit. And that's going to give you at 240 volts about your 7.7 .7 kilowatts. Now that's okay. You don't have to know what that means. I'll break it down. Okay. So a 7.7 .7 kilowatt charger is going to get you charged back up for your average daily commute out to the groceries and back out to the office and back in about one to two hours. So you're topping up pretty quick there. And if you're totally dead, you just crawled home and made it, then you're going to be able to recharge your battery fully in about 6.5 to nine hours, depending on the size of that battery that you have. Most batteries that we see today are getting closer to that 60, 70 kilowatt hour range. Traditionally, the Nissan Leaf that, that used to be very popular, the, the first revisions of them, uh, they were all around you know, 30 to 50 kilowatt hours. So it's in that 50 to 70 kilowatt hour range is I think what's more reasonable to consider for battery capacity today. And last, the big puppy, level three charging, DC fast charging. Okay, so now you can see that the top half of the plug actually looks identical, and that's because it is. It'll actually fit right on top there. But now down beneath your level two plug, you have these two DC prongs, and that's where the energy is actually going to be transmitted. Because what's happening is that on the other, the other versions, level one and level two, it's AC charging right from your house, typical AC sine waves, what you get, and into your vehicle. But for level three, the conversion to DC to charge that battery is actually happening within these chargers, okay? So you can get way higher power output. And that's up to about 350 kilowatts today. But I've already heard advancements in this technology that they're getting up to 400, 450, and then a new standard's gonna be developed up to 1,000. So it's, uh, it's rapidly changing. It's one of those aspects of the industry that continuously is growing. So just to give you an idea of what kind of each output of fast chargers can do, a 50 kilowatt will charge you from 0% up to full in about an hour and a half. And, and if you actually did the math for it, it's less. But what you'll find with DC fast charging is there's a lot of other factors at play. Your battery conditioning makes, makes a big difference. How hot is it? How cold is it? Um, how many times have you fast charged it recently? All of these things play a role in how quickly you can draw energy from a charger. It's not just how fast the charger can put out. But this is an approximation, and it usually holds true over time. A 100 kilowatt charger from dead will get you fully recharged in 45 minutes, and a 150 kilowatt charger will get you recharged there in about 30 minutes. But most of the time, what you'll see metrics is saying it'll take you from 30% to 80% in X minutes. And that's, that's also more realistic because you're, you're essentially arriving when you're kind of getting low, and you want to charge up to that 80% mark. And then you want to get back out on the road because that's typically when you'll you'll cap your fast charging it'll start to trickle charge after that 80 percent so if you're ever using one of these public fast chargers i recommend to, to unplug at that 80 percent mark it's polite for other users 
And it's also where you're going to lose your most efficient charging, uh, your charging curve. But one key point here that's really important to bring up is to know your vehicle's capability. Okay. The number of times I've gotten phone calls with people saying, I, your 100 kilowatt charger is not, it's, I'm only getting 50 kilowatts. Okay. Well, what are you driving? I'm driving a Nissan Leaf. Well, the Nissan Leaf can only pull 50 kilowatts mo at most. So you, you run into these problems where the vehicle is actually incapable of taking as much output as the charger can. So when you're looking up specs on your vehicle, most people look at horsepower, leather seats, all this fun stuff. But for electric vehicles, you need to start looking at some of these other values here. How fast can it charge? Does it have a heat pump? How efficient is it? All of these kinds of metrics that need to go a little bit further than what we may be used to seeing on gas powered vehicles. Also, I will note that in the city of Penticton, we are installing four 50 kilowatt uh, flow fast chargers this year throughout the city. So uh, we, we have a few fast chargers today and there's gonna be even more deployed, which we're excited about. Okay, so now you know all about fast charging, slow charging, everything in between. You know about the impacts and now you wanna go buy one, of course. So the good news is, is that there's more options today than there used to be. Gone are the days of picking between a Nissan Leaf and a Tesla. Okay, the light duty sector is blowing up. That's one of my favorites in a Hyundai Ionic 5. There's new vehicle classes coming online. That's the Ford F-150 Lightning. Trucks are here, trucks are here. Next year, SUVs and minivans probably. And of course, commercial users are not left in the dust. This is the Ford Transit that's fully electric and it is offering something to that class of vehicles and to that business user that hasn't been there traditionally. So it's very encouraging to see what's becoming available today in the industry. Okay, so now you've picked a vehicle and now you realize, oh no, I gotta check if I have capacity on my panel. Can I even charge my vehicle at home? And that's when you wanna start talking about service upgrades, okay? So the first thing you wanna do is to call your electrician, okay? Your electrician will look at your panel and they'll be able to tell you whether you need a service upgrade or not. At the city of Penticton, a service upgrade will take two weeks minimum, and it could be even more depending on the complexity and the upstream infrastructure that has to be changed out from the utility. And three phase service upgrades if you're a commercial or industrial user, uh, or just a very large load in, an, in a big home, uh, then it, it could be even more timeline because those kinds of projects, you're beholden to what materials are available at the time, supply chain issues are rampant across every industry, and that could take a little bit longer. But there is good news, okay? If your electrician says, hey, you need a service upgrade, there's a couple options before you go down that road, okay? There's hardware solutions called energy management systems. And you may see, have seen them before. One, one is called a load miser, one's called a DCC. And I'll explain a little bit about what these are actually doing, okay? With a load miser, what it'll do is it'll take your panel and it'll say, okay, what, what load would you like to use as an either or with your vehicle? Most people will pick their electric oven or something like that. And what it'll do is it'll say, if you're cooking dinner, you are not able to charge your vehicle. It'll turn it off and it'll keep your, it'll keep your oven on. As soon as your oven turns off, it'll turn on your electric vehicle charger. And so by doing this, you negate the need for a service upgrade because you can go to the safety inspector and you can say, hey, look, these two will never be on at the same time. So you know you're only going to be pulling about the same value as an oven. You'll just be doing it with an electric vehicle throughout the evening. And so that is compliant with the code and they are able to install that hardware, but it does cost money. There is costs associated with this piece of hardware that you have to install in your home. A DCC is very similar, except for it's going to watch your overall home. And it's going to say, okay, if the home as a total package gets close to that limit that they're allowed to draw, we'll shut off the EV charger. But what we're finding is that most people aren't actually using as much load as the code is calculated to tell us they are. Okay, utilities have known this for many, many, many years. And that's why most utilities, if not all, have always modeled a customer to use less energy than what their panel says they probably do according to the Canadian Electrical Code. Okay, now before you start getting up in arms about the Canadian Electrical Code is, is terrible and you know the safety inspectors are doing us all wrong, TSBC, that's your local safety authority, they're aware of this and they've partnered with these or these utilities. When I was at Fortis, I was working with them. I'm working with them now at the city of Penticton to use smart meter data to understand if you actually do have capacity without doing the calculated demand check, okay? And, and let me explain a little bit about what this means. My home's a great example of this here. I have a 100 amp panel. I currently live in West Kelowna as I'm trying to relocate back down south there. So I'm a BC Hydro customer today, okay? I have a smart meter on my home. 
what I'm able to do is look at my panel and, and I can tell you that the calculations tell me that, that panel is fully loaded. If I wanted to add an EV charger or a heat pump or a cryptocurrency miner or anything else, a hot tub, anything like that, that's going to trigger a service upgrade. That's going to be high costs. There could be upstream impacts to BC Hydro that'll further increase my cost. It's a bit of a kick in the pants after I buy an electric vehicle and I now have to incur this large expense at home, right? So I can use my smart meter data to look back and say, okay, my last 12 months, what was my actual peak? And I find out that I'm not peaking close to my 100 amps. I'm actually peaking around 45 amps. And that's more than enough capacity to lead me to do something fun with it. A heat pump and a small charger or a large charger, whatever I want to do to fully utilize the assets that I have available to me today. And that's very good. That's very good for the world, right? We want to be fully utilizing the equipment that we have in the ground because any kind of excessive growth is going to be managed best by using what we have today, okay? So this is a very important tool that's in our back pocket. Now, keep in mind that you do have to have a smart meter on your home and it has to be running for at least 12 months to collect this data in order to use it. So not today, but we're, you know, I'm looking into this, the city of Penticton is, is how we can bring this level of service to our customers to ensure that they're able to fully utilize the systems that they have. Now, of course, if you do need a service upgrade, a city of Penticton, personally, we have a good option for you. You can actually finance that service upgrade cost and put it on your bill uh, as a very low interest loan. So uh, the city of Penticton is especially understanding of this challenge and wants to help customers where we can while we're getting up to speed on everything else. Okay, so now you understand how to get a service upgrade. You've gone out, you've purchased your vehicle, you've upgraded your panel or not, you didn't need to. And now your neighbor's done it and your neighbor neighbor and everyone else. Well, this is actually expected because according to the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030 and the ZEV mandates that are, are federal, uh, federally enforced, 26% of new vehicle sales by 2026 have to be zero emissions. And in BC, we're special here. It's less, it's less the rest of the province, we, or the rest of the provinces, sorry. 90% of new vehicle sales by 2030, big jump in four years, have to be zero emissions, okay? That poses a challenge for utilities, I'll tell you that jump. And then finally, we'll limp our way to the finish line 100% by 2035. I say limp, but that's still quite a fast limp in my opinion, trying to get to 2035, where 100% of new vehicles sold are zero emissions, most of those probably being electric. Okay, so even if I haven't convinced you to buy one by now, the province and the federal governments, they're doing their job and forcing you to. So now let's look at what's actually going to happen to our system when you all buy one. Okay, you'll have to bear with me. I'm not an artist. I'm an engineer by training. You can probably tell by now on this, uh, this terrible drawing. But what you see here up top is our primary distribution lines. You've probably seen them overhead. Most municipalities and utilities are all going underground now. So you may be lucky enough to not have to look at this. Um, but I always think they're beautiful, but I'm a little biased, I guess. Now on these poles or in your neighborhoods along property lines, you'll see distribution transformers. Okay, this is what's gonna take the primary high voltage that we navigate around the city with and transfer, transition it or transform it into the 12240 that you know and love inside of your homes, okay? Now off of this transformer, you'll have a few houses. In this example, I've said about six houses, okay? Now the typical load that a utility will estimate that each of these homes are gonna use is between five to 10, depending if you have gas heat or electric heat. So let's say for the benefit of this example that all of these homes have electric heat. Now, right away, you'll look at me and you'll go 10 times six is 60. And this transformer says it's only 50. So you've overloaded the transformer. Well, coincidental peak between all of these homes peaking at that 10 kilowatts at the same time, very unlikely. So we know that we're okay to overload a little bit like this by quick hand counts. But here's a problem. What happens when this person gets an EV charger and then this person and then this person? Well, now it actually makes a difference. As I said, these home chargers could be anywhere between five and 19.2 kilowatts, but we know most of them are around seven. So let's call them seven. Now, even if just three homes get seven kilowatt chargers and add them on here, that's a problem for us. It's an even bigger compounding problem if they've done their homework and they've added load to their panel without actually having to get a service upgrade because now the utility is unaware that this work is happening, okay? And the only way we're gonna find out is if this distribution transformer becomes overloaded or if we use other proactive measurement tools. And don't worry, every utility that I've been working for has these proactive measurement tools out there and they're continuing to evolve with this changing industry. So nothing bad is gonna happen. We're gonna be on top of this. 
But let's take a look at what's actually happening inside the home now when you add that EV charger and potentially a way that utilities can mitigate this risk, mitigate the challenge. So the first step is to mitigate this demand. What you're looking at now is what's typically called a duck curve in the industry, okay? It looks a little bit like a duck, I guess, but I'll just kind of explain what's happening here. So these hours along the bottom are the hours of the day. So 1 a.m., 2 a.m., yada, yada, yada. Okay, and these kilowatt hours on the, on the left here are consumption. And we can roughly assume that the kilowatt hours consumption is equivalent to the kilowatt demand. And please, I know my first slide said there's a difference between them, and it's true, but just bear with me for this example. So you can see here that somebody wakes up around 5 a.m., and they get up early riser and they start using a little bit of electricity. They're cooking their coffee, they're making their eggs, they're doing whatever they need to do in the morning, listening to some music. They get ready and they head out for work around 8.30, okay? Now your load drops back down for the majority of the day. Maybe someone comes home at lunch, maybe you got some other stuff happening and there's a little bit of a peak there and drops back down. And then comes the traditional utility peak right around that dinner time. You come home, you turn on the oven, you turn on your laundry, you turn on the music, you turn on your lights, the kids are playing with the toys, the video games are on, yada, yada, it all happens. And it, and it creates this peak on the system, okay? Now, people go to bed later and it all drops off and the whole thing lather, rinse, repeat all the time. But here's the problem. Now let's take that same situation where you have an EV. You come home from work, that's when you're plugging it in. So now, coincidentally, at the same time as you're turning on your oven, you're turning on your laundry, you're cooking your dinner, whatever, you've now added your EV charging load right on top of that. And that's what this red terrifying mountain of a, <laughs> of a power consumption line is. Now, don't worry, there's gonna be a solution here. But the problem, just so you understand for utilities is that we have to build to this peak, okay? We can't, just because we only use that peak for moments a day even, it doesn't mean that we can just overload for minutes and then just cool down over here. No, we have to build to the capacity of this peak. So this is a problem when you have a really peaky system where it's only used for minutes a day like this. And the rest of the time, it's sitting there almost vacant, right? And that's, that's really challenging. We don't want to do that. We want to fully utilize the assets that we have. So utilities are working on these kinds of programs that will do an event like this. So take the same situation. You come home, you plug in your vehicle. But now, instead of your vehicle starting to charge right away, it sits idle. Nothing happens. It sits there. You're, you've opted into a program, you're participating in a program that the utility gets to tell your vehicle when is a safe time to charge for the grid. <clears throat> now, this is important because you're already going to have your existing peak here, but at least you're not adding this red value, okay? Now, you've programmed into your phone or into your car or somehow to tell the utility, hey, I got to be out by 6 a.m. I cannot be late. I, I got to be out. I want to be fully charged by 6 a.m. So utility is taking all of this information in. It knows Okay, if, if your neighbor's participating and you're participating and their neighbor's participating, when is the time when we have the capacity on the grid to spread out these charge events? And what it looks like for this customer is, oh, the utility says, hey, we have capacity around 11 p.m. So that's when we're going to turn it on. And we're not even going to charge as fast as it can. We're not going to let you get up to that seven kilowatts that your charger can output. We're going to drag it out a little bit. But don't worry, we're going to get you fully charged up by the time you need to leave for work, 5 a.m., you give you an extra hour there. You can get early if you want to. Now, this is a really important, this is a really important solution for what we're trying to do. Because what you can tell is that blue is your normal curve before EVs. This is traditional as it is today. Red is what happens if you plug in your EV without any kind of mitigation, without any kind of concern or consideration for the grid. But green, as you can see, well, it's not even that much higher than blue. And in some cases, we can actually get it to be similar. And that's what we want. Ultimately, what we want is a nice flat line where the utility is always using its maximum capacity and it never reaches these peaky values. Okay. And this is kind of what I'm calling step one of the system. Mitigate the demand. Try and kick out that charge event to the middle of the night. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some questions on this, but I'll jump ahead right away on this. What if I want to opt out? What if I got hockey tonight? What if I want to go for a beer? Totally fine. Everyone who participates in a program like this has the ability to opt out with one button and they charge their vehicle immediately. You can go back to red, right? But what you'll get if you do it in the evening is some utilities are piloting incentives, right? So a small monetary incentive, 10 cents, 50 cents, whatever that value needs to be to get customers to charge in the middle of the night, okay? And this, by the way, is called a non-wire solution, okay? So when you think of the ways that we can meet the evolving needs of the electrification of transportation and heating and cooling, one way is to build bigger poles and wire 
build, build another site C, build three, build nine, whatever it takes, right? But that's not efficient because we don't want to build a system to meet this momentary peak right up here. What we want is to fully utilize the assets we have in the ground. If you're getting a theme from it, good. I hope you're understanding that. And that's why these non-wire solutions, these demand side management solutions are so important to the future of our grid. But keep in mind, this is only step one. Step two, this is where it gets fun. So take the same situation, okay? So now you've come home, you've plugged in your vehicle. But now instead of charging, you're just sitting stagnant. And actually is the next step, not only are you sitting stagnant, you're actually using the energy in your battery to offset your home peak. It's called V2G or vehicle to grid, sometimes vehicle to home, vehicle to X, whatever you want to see. Uh, Ford has marketed this product as a resilience effort. Okay, so let's say there's a storm scenario and there's an outage on your home. Well, the Ford F-150 Lightning is being marketed to be able to power your home right from the battery on the vehicle. And that's what I'm talking about here. Right. An emergency situation, very valuable, especially if you live in a rural area that is susceptible to long term outages. But where it's also valuable for me as a utility guy is to take this red peak, delete it, and then to take this green peak, keep it where it is, but even to take it at dinner time and shave off a little bit of this peak. Right. And that would be another incentive potentially for the customer. So what I'm talking about here is that you come home, you plug in. You're offsetting your own dinner time peak when you're cooking dinner, listening to music, all that, with a little bit of energy from the battery in your vehicle and a little bit of energy from the grid. And we're giving you a small incentive to do that. And then in the middle of the night, when there's capacity on the grid, that's when we'll, we'll look to charge your battery back up. And this is going to give us a really nice flat line. It's going to give you the potential benefit of incentives while you're trying to charge your vehicle. And it's also going to give us the stability that we look for, the resilience that we need in our electric system. Okay, so this is what's exciting to me about battery electric vehicles, right? When people think of battery electric vehicles, they go, oh my goodness, the grid's going to blow up. This is all going to, it's going to be terrible. Yes, there is challenges, but these are where their opportunities are, right? We've never had this ability before. We've never had an energy storage asset right in the home that we can potentially integrate into the grid for people that want to do it. And that's what excites me. Now, before I move on, I just want to clarify there is no magic bullet. There is no matter, there's no level of non-wire solutions that'll ever get us 100% away from needing capital investment into our system, okay? As we transition all of these loads, these, these gas-based loads in vehicles, natural gas heating to electrification, there will need to be investment in our system, okay? So don't think just because I'm showing this to you that it's gonna fix all the problems. We do still need to have an understanding that there will be investments that utilities have to make into the electric grid, into the electric system. Okay, now let's talk about how to get you some money back when you go and get this vehicle. The Clean BC Go Electric rebate program is fantastic. Okay, there's a portion for, for vehicles, which we'll go over now, and then a portion for chargers. <clears throat> now, this has changed recently for the vehicle portion, and it's based on your individual income. And I say individual because it does matter who in the home is applying for it. Okay, so depending on your income, you'll get a larger or smaller rebate on a new vehicle. Now, the vehicle class also matters. And this was a great change because previously a light duty vehicle with a, media, with a minimum trim of 55 grand was there, but a larger vehicle was not. So now they've opened up this, this offering to allow for this new vehicle class of station wagons, minivans and SUVs, trucks to be included in this program. And then there's chargers, okay? Now the single family home charger, 300, it's actually up to 350 bucks right now towards the purchase and installation of eligible level two chargers. And you can check out that eligibility list on the BC Hydro website. If you live in a territory of a municipal electric utility like the city of Penticton, and, and that city buys power from Fortis, you go to Fortis for it. If you live in BC Hydro territory or New Westminster, you go to BC Hydro for that rebate. Okay, so if you're looking for where to apply, I'm happy to provide that information, but it'll be either Fortis BC or BC Hydro. And now, if you're not in a single family home, if you're in an apartment building, there's many, many, many more rebates for you because there's a lot more infrastructure that's required to energize a parkade to get it ready for EV charging. Okay, so you can get up to $3,000 towards an EV ready plan that'll just let your strata figure out what is the first step? How do we go through this? What does the electrical upgrade look like? Okay, then once you know what's happening, you can get up to $120,000 towards the actual infrastructure investment to get those wired conduits and those wires and those junction boxes 
ready for, for chargers when the resident of the MERB wants to actually go and put one in. And then finally, the resident who decides to go out and buy one can get a little bit of money towards that cost as well. So it's a much more complex solution to look at apartment buildings, but there's a lot more incentives to support it. And we're always happy to answer questions and facilitate these kinds of conversations as well and coordinate with Fortis BC who handles this kind of work. Okay, so now you've gotten it. And for MERBs and business owners, and when MERBs, I say multi-unit residential buildings, apartment complexes, there's one more benefit to consider. And that's because we live in beautiful British Columbia. <clears throat> we have the low carbon fuel standard, soon to be the low carbon fuel act, okay? Now this little piece of legislation goes a long way if you wanna get on top of electric vehicles early, okay? I'm not gonna read that to you. I'll, I'll send you a link if you want to. But basically what this is, is it's, it's a tool that allows commercial businesses and any owners of EV chargers outside of residential to actually claim the energy that they're using to charge electric vehicles to generate carbon credits, okay? And those carbon credits can be sold on a carbon credit market to give a little bit of money back. And this is an ongoing program, okay? So this is open to commercial businesses. If you own EV chargers to provide, power, to provide a charger for employees or for customers who are coming into your business. It's also relevant if you own public fast chargers. And it's also relevant, finally, if you are a strata council inside of an apartment building. Okay. And that's really where you can start to justify some of the capital investment that's needed to put chargers in your parkade. You can get a bit of that money back and it's ongoing for as long as this program is alive and it's just getting started. So how does it actually work? And this is good for strata councils. And I have no problem doing deeper deep dive on how to use the BC low carbon fuel standard in another session, but at a high level, you basically utilize the transportation fuel reporting system, the TFRS, you declare all your chargers that you have, it has a little bit of information you need to have on that, and then you actually just grab the data. Most of these chargers nowadays are, are smart chargers, they'll tell you how much energy has been consumed, and you just grab all of that data out of each charger and you submit it to the province, okay? And then they give you some carbon credits, and then you get to sell those credits. So to give you an understanding of how much a carbon credit is worth right now, this is a market snapshot from quarter four of 2022. The average price was about $446 that you're, uh, you're spending to sell a credit, okay? Now to generate that same credit, it costs you at 12 cents per kilowatt hour, about $136 of energy, okay? So to, to kind of make, make that make sense, you know, regardless of how many cars are charging or not, for every $136 of electricity that you're buying to charge a vehicle, you can sell it for approximately $446 back. So it, right there, it's a revenue, it's a revenue positive adventure that you can go on with all of these chargers that you're going to be installing at your commercial businesses and your apartment complexes. And I'm sorry to single family homes, this is not relevant for you. You are not, not able to claim carbon credits for home charging. And now if that wasn't enough, there is also a federal program to do pretty much the exact same thing. And it's hilarious because we thought when this first came out, I thought, no way I can claim on both, right? I'll, oh, am I gonna claim on BC or am I gonna claim on that? You can claim on both. And that is very funny. Now, unfortunately, it's not the same. It's a little bit different on who gets to claim the credit and where it's most relevant. So, so for MERBs and apartment complexes and stratas, unfortunately you don't get to double dip onto the federal program. But for business owners who are providing charging for their employees, it is, and you can claim those credits on both the provincial and federal programs. So a significant uh, factor for revenue as you look at whether it's worthwhile to invest in EV charging for your businesses. Now this, this is just getting started. It was just launched last year. People are still registering. I don't believe that, that a really solid market has been established yet, but you can expect that to come online as more people are registering in, the, in this upcoming year here. Okay. That was a lot of information I've gone over. So I just wanna bring up a summary here, okay? In summary, don't just think about the fuel transition to electricity, increase your active transportation. Really think, can I, can I go by bike? Can I go by walking? Are my municipalities offering me infrastructure to use these things? And if not, can I call them? Can I ask them to, okay? Work with your utility when you're looking into service upgrades. Call your electrician, understand your options, understand if you can utilize that smart meter data to reduce your need for an actual service upgrade. Participate in utility offer programs, please, please, please. As we come along and as we grow and more utilities are trying these pilots out, maybe, maybe customers will adopt this, maybe this. Participate, participate. It's usually worthwhile for your benefit and it also impacts our ability to manage our system. So it's, it's, it's mutually beneficial, please participate. 
Utilize the rebates for EVs. If you're going to buy an EV, there's lots of opportunity right now to get some money back. That won't always be the case. After 2035, when every new vehicle has to be electric, they're not going to pay you to go and do that. So just think about that as you, as you start to consider an EV. And lastly, if you're able to utilize these carbon credit markets, right there, there's a business case. And, and most of the time, that's because these are the companies, the MERBs or whoever, that have to invest a lot of capital up front. But there's a way for you to get ongoing revenue back. And I'm happy to provide more information on any of this. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Drayden. That's fantastic. Uh, very exciting. I do have a list of questions and maybe I'll just start. Uh, Perfect. Okay. Uh, the first one is from Ruth. Uh, you've, you've maybe given her some more options. She was originally thinking that she had to upgrade to a 200 amp service. She was anticipating installing a level two charger plus doing a few other retrofits in her house. She lives in Summerland and the district of Summerland said that she had to pay $20,000 just to upgrade. Never, this doesn't even include electricians costs. So I guess the question is, are municipalities supporting uh, this sort of switching to, uh, you know, you've given some options, but is, how, how, for instance, in Penticton or in the RDUS, do they have a similar high charge just for switching? Now, it depends on the level of service upgrade you're doing. For the okay. city of Penticton, we have a flat rate. If you're going from a 100 or 125 amp service to a 200 amp service, there's a flat rate that they'll charge you no matter what. But that's not true for every system. And that's also not true if you're going from 200 amps and upwards. As I said before, that can be variable. But what I want to consider, because as you see, Ruth is in Pint or Summerland here. So she doesn't have the ability to use smart meter data. I don't believe they're on smart meters yet, but what she'll want to do to, to mitigate that cost is to talk to an electrician about installing one of those hardware energy management systems, a load miser or a DCC. Those will run, they're expensive. They're about $3,000 plus labor to put them in, but they're not $20,000. And as long as you're okay with switching between your electric oven and your EV charger, which most people are, when you want to charge in the middle of the night, you don't also need to be cooking, cooking things in your oven, hopefully not. But that's the best option for, for a utility customer who doesn't have the advantage of using smart meter data for the last 12 months to prove that they have capacity on their system. That's great. Uh, I think a lot of us uh, here tonight are going to be investigating that option. I know. Yeah, and the last one is the city of Penticton also offers, if you do have to trigger that service upgrade, there is that loan plan that we do offer you a, a small interest loan on your electric bill to be paid off over time. Uh, uh, someone is asking, Sheila is asking, she has heard that level two charging is cheaper than level one. Something about, I guess, the length of time. Have you heard that? Uh, uh, well, level two charging and level one charging will actually do the same thing in your home, right? Whether it, you're paying per kilowatt hour in your home, where level two charging could actually be cheaper feasibly is that if you're in a system like Fortis BC, for example, had an incentive program where if they can control you when your charge event happens, that they'll reduce the cost or potentially give you a small monetary value for that. And that is only possible depending on your car and your charger through a level two charger. But most systems like this are actually looking at communicating directly to your vehicle. So when that's the case, then there would be no real benefit um, for a level two versus level one, other than just the charge speed at which you can, can get that energy into your car. Thank you. Now, Jim has a question and I'm gonna get him to turn on his microphone because it's a little bit complicated. It's about car batteries that draw at different rates and being charged per minute at- uh, um, Fast you know, chargers, yeah. Fast chargers. So Jim, do you wanna turn on your microphone and ask that question? Yeah, thanks. Great, Drayden. We're really enjoying this. Um, yeah, I, I have a concern about the fact that many cars, well, all cars draw at a different uh, a different time for the kil kilowatt hours that they purchase. So if you're in a small car, like a, a, say a, a Leaf, uh, as opposed to a, a uh, car like a, a Tesla, you're going to be paying more per kilowatt hour just because your battery draws more slowly. How is that going to be addressed? It doesn't seem fair. Thank you, Jim. That's a great question. So just to clarify for everyone, what Jim is talking about is public charging. Because right now, the regulatory environment only allows us to bill public charging on a per minute basis. We actually aren't allowed to bill on an actual consumption per kilowatt hour basis, okay? So typically on, I'll use Fortis BC as an example because I deployed a bunch of those. It was 54 cents per minute to use our 100 kilowatt charger and 26 cents per minute to use our 50 kilowatt charger. And as Jim pointed out, depending on the vehicle you have, depending on the temperature outside, depending on the battery conditioning that took place leading up to the charge event, 
your vehicle will charge at a very different rate and it fluctuates incredibly high and over 80 percent it's different it's wild okay so what i can tell you today is that that has been taken under consideration by measurement canada we have been lobbying our tails off to try and get them to change it and at the end of 2022 they completed a consultation on what it looks like to transition to consumption-based billing now nearly every single electric vehicle public charger provider is interested in trying to move to that system for that exact reason, Jim. And it's not quite as clean as just a, a quick transition, but I can tell you that I'm fully expecting to be a consumption kilowatt hour based billing for public charging in the very near future. Level twos will go first, level threes will come second, which we had issues with as well, actually, that Measurement Canada prioritized the wrong one in our opinion, but that's okay. They're working on it. Utilities and EV charging manufacturers are working through this this challenge with them, and I can guarantee it's going to be a lot better in the near future. But yeah, right now, Jim, my recommendation is that if you know you can't pull a high energy because of either your battery conditioning or just your vehicle make and model or any other factor going on, go to the lowest, smallest charger that you can find and get that reduced per minute charge while until you can draw that faster rate and unplug and go to the other one. Incredibly inconvenient, not a realistic solution long term, but this is a short term issue, I believe. Thank you. Janelle, who has a business and who needs a truck for her business, she's uh, trucking around heavy uh, boxes of bees. Um, she, they are looking, they want to buy an EV truck, uh, but they don't see one so far that's under $70,000. I guess she's wondering about your advice and can uh, a, a business like hers uh, take advantage of um, well, some of these rebates you're talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. I the funny part is, is even if you wanted to go buy a truck today, there is issues with supply chain, right? That most electric vehicles, the problem is actually getting your hands on one today. So in my opinion, there's going to be a sweet spot. Right now, if you go and order a vehicle, there's a chance it's not even going to get to your house within six to eight to 12 months. But at some point too in the future, those rebates will be gone. So I think there's going to be this real, this real point, this turning point where electric vehicles will be readily available. It'll drive the market down because there'll be more options available rebates will still be out there. That is kind of what I think is gonna be probably the best time to try and buy one. I mean, if you can get your hands on one now, it's always a good time too. But I do think with all the options coming out, the market will mature a little bit. Rebates will still be available in the near, in the like kind of near to medium future, I believe. And you'll wanna try and time it to take advantage of that. Thanks. Uh, we've got someone that's wondering whether uh, we're, Inevitably, electrical utilities are going to move to variable demand-based pricing for electricity. Is that something you think is in our future in BC? Oh, very fun, very fun. So there's there's kind of two mechanisms that there, right? You can look at time of use billing, which is energy is cheaper after 9 p.m., and then there's demand-based billing. So if you're a commercial business owner right now, you'll already know this that your demand billing basically means whatever your peak demand is, wherever that red mountain was that I showed you, you pay a bill based on a ratio of that, right? You also pay for consumption, but you're heavily impacted by how, how much that peak demand is. It's an interesting thought and it naturally motivates customers to reduce their peak, right? To start looking at ways to mitigate their peak demand. Now, before I think most utilities are going to move to that, they'll try some of these incentive programs. They'll try to, to convince customers to either allow utilities to control the load with, hey, can we turn down your thermometer by one degree in the middle of the summer to save some AC load during a heat wave? Or can we change your EV charger to charge in the middle of the night, right? My issue personally with time of use billing is that utilities have gone to this and it's been proven that if you have time of use rates that kick in at 9 p.m., you're artificially creating another peak at 9 p.m. Yes, you'll have your normal dinner time peak, and then you'll have this massive peak with everyone who has programmable load turning it on at the same time, right when the cheap rate starts. It doesn't matter if it goes from 9 p.m. to 8 a.m. or something like that. People always start it at 9 p.m., right? So the challenge with time of use is that it just kicks the can down the road a bit, but it still creates this, this problem of a, peaky, uh, of a peaky distribution system. When if we can use incentive programs and the technology that's available to us today in 2023 to try and control this load at a more granular level, we'll get to that goal of what we want of a flat distribution profile a lot faster. I think I'll just uh, give you one more question. It's an important one from Erica. She is saying, you know, not everybody's going to be able to afford to install a charger in their home or have access to one in their multi-unit um, building. How can engineers like you work with utilities and municipalities to make more affordable and accessible charging solutions for, you know, resident, say residents downtown, someone living 
in an apartment, a small apartment complex. So people that don't have access to either um, home, home charging. It's a great question. Thank you, Erica. It's good, good to hear you again. Uh, this is prevalent, especially in the lower mainland, right, where a multi-unit residential building might come and do challenges and say, hey, let's get EV chargers, and they look at the bill, and it's $300,000, and they're only getting $80,000 back as part of the Clean BC Go Electric Rebate Program. Well, that's a lot of money to eat from the Strata Council, and a lot of residents who aren't owning EVs today are going, I'm not paying for that, right, and so this is a realistic challenge that we see today. So what I would say is that for those customers, they should work with their strata councils to find out is level one charging an option? Is there outlets in a parkade that they can use? Level one chargers are typically included with the vehicle, the lower impact of the system, the lower impact to the overall apartment electric draw, and they're still probably going to get you where you need to go. And to kind of answer her broader question about what you can do as an engineering student or what you can do to look at this from a technical standpoint, I love that challenge. That's why I'm in the job I'm in. What we're looking at is what is everyone else in the industry doing? Seattle City and Light has a really interesting program right now where if you run into this problem where you don't have the ability to charge at home or you live in an apartment complex, but there's an adjacent street pole with, with power connections on it, you can call them and you can say, I want a level two charger put right here. And they will come out and they'll deploy a level two charger. Now, of course, you have to pay the rates that they're setting, but it's an option to give you something close to home that may be a better path forward than what you're able to get in your apartment complex. And that's not to say the city of Penticton is going to offer that or anyone else in BC, but I can tell you that utilities work really closely together. The industry is very tightly knit and we're trying to learn from each other about what's an effective way to tackle that problem for people who feel they have the right to charge. At some point, legislation may come in that mandates people to have the right to charge. But until then, can utilities offer programs like that to give another option? I'm going to squeak in one last question because we've had a good one and that's <clears throat> whether solar has a role to play both in EV charging for people to put in as, uh, a unit, especially for charging, <clears throat> and also for helping uh, a community deal with peak demand. Absolutely, absolutely, right? I mean, the future grid, grid modernization is going to include a massive amount of battery storage, okay? When you think about these kind of generation tools like wind and solar, the problem with them is that solar doesn't generate when it's not sunny and wind doesn't generate when it's not windy, right? But when those things are happening is not necessarily the time that we need that demand, right? As I showed you, some resident, most residential demand is at 6 p.m. Not a lot of sun at that time. You need to utilize battery storage to take, to take full advantage of solar generation. They go hand in hand. They're tied together in these grid modernization techniques. And what's exciting about solar is that when you're thinking, oh, I want to get solar, but yeah, I'm not at home in the middle of the day. What am I going to do? Do I have to buy a battery? Well, if you're parked at least one vehicle at home in the middle of the day, you have a battery, you have a battery in your house, right? And that's the exciting part is that as much of these electric vehicles are cool and they're fun and they're offering a, a, you know, a climate solution, they're also energy storage that you have at your home to backfeed your home, to store energy from solar or other kind of micro generation you may have. Um, and don't get me wrong, having battery storage is great. If you, if you have a vehicle that's often out of the, out of the home, that's another great tool, but there's grid level battery storage, there's residential level battery storage, a lot of these solutions are needed to shave that peak demand of a whole electric system and to give us the resiliency moving forward that we want. Great. Uh, this has been fantastic. I'm actually going to pass things over to Sue uh, to uh, end the evening. Thanks so much, Drayden. Um, just a couple of notes before we wind up um, about our upcoming deep dives. We're still working on February's topic, so just check out our website in the next week or two or better yet, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, that comes out near the beginning of each month. I think Lori will put the um, sign up link into the chat. And in March, our deep dive will be about geothermal systems, how ground source heat pumps work, and how we can use the relatively stable temperature just below our feet to heat and cool our schools, apartments, homes, and even our pools. So it'll be an interesting talk, and um, we encourage you to keep an eye out for registration information for that. Um, Margaret already mentioned that we will be sending out an email tomorrow to follow up on this, and it will have all the links that we've provided in the, in the session, as well as a video recording that we hope that you will share with others. So thanks again, Drayden, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Take care and we hope to see you again soon. And if you want to turn on your video folks and let's uh, let's let Drayden know this was a fantastic presentation. Thanks so much.
and feel free to turn on your mic and say uh, say hello and thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Drake. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Great, Hurry great, up and great. move to Penticton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Say good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now.